stand and sing with us. We are fortunate to have a God that can turn graves into gardens, so let's sing that for him this morning. I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise and treasure Nothing is better. 
turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Good morning, New Life. You guys can all sit down uh, right now. We're going to do some announcements, and we'll get right back to singing here in a minute. So uh, my name is Paul Van Huculum. I am one of the regular attenders here at uh, New Life, and I want to say one more time, welcome to everyone, especially if you're visiting with us today. We want to make sure you guys feel uh, welcome with us. There is something in the seat back of all your chairs. It's called the Let's Connect card. If you are visiting here, please give us your name, write down your email or your phone number if you want. You can drop these in the offering baskets as they go by or at the connection table out front. This is just one way we want to connect with you guys uh, moving forward. All right, our next announcement. Oh, before I get to the next announcements, if you guys don't have a bulletin, everything that I'm going to say now is in the bulletin. We're not going to hit everything, but just please look at these bulletins. There is a ton of information on here that's really quite good. All right, so first announcement, we have updated our church website. The church website itself hasn't changed a whole lot, but the web address has changed. Um, and that's because of our changing from the RCA to the Alliance. Uh, this needed to change. If on your phone or your computer you just go to the old website, you'll be redirected to this one. So you really don't need to do anything. Maybe just bookmark it as a new one moving forward. All right, let's see. Oh, you'll also get our emails will be slightly different. Uh, so when you get an email from us, just know that it'll look a little bit different uh, moving forward. All right, Easter is coming up, and you can read in the bulletins for more dates on a variety of things. But one thing we wanted to make you guys know today is that today is the last kind of opportunity to uh, uh, find an Easter lily or make a donation for an Easter lily. Uh, there is information in the... Uh, area right out front there. Uh, basically, it's a, a donation. We'll display the Easter lily, Easter lily during church, and then you can take it home with you uh, afterwards. So today's the last day to do that, so make sure to check that out. All right, Ladies' Night Out is coming up on Tuesday, March 21st at 6.30 here at the church. Um, dessert will be provided and bring a game that you would like to play. Sounds like a great time. Again, sign out out front. All right, next, this is a very exciting one for me. Uh, uh, there is going to be a Texas Roadhouse uh, fundraiser coming up on March 29th from 4 to 10 p.m. This is a really awesome thing. They'll donate 10% of everything we spend there back to the church. All you really need to do is put your receipt uh, in the box near the, the hostess. So uh, I'm sure my family will be there. I would encourage anyone else to go there, and Texas Roadhouse is uh, really kind for putting this together for us. So Please consider that moving forward. And uh, coming close to the end, this is a, this is a big one. Um, elder and deacon nominations are coming up again. Uh, this is a, a critical thing in our church. Uh, I served as a deacon before, and it was one of the most uh, fulfilling experiences that I've had while being here. You really, uh, it's a great chance to serve. Um, if you've done this in the past, uh, or if you've never done it before, really this is something that we're really interested in. So two ways to go about it. One is you can think of someone in the church and say, hey, I think they'd be really good at this role. And if you do that, go and talk to them and, and say, this is kind of what we're thinking. Um, and then if they kind of agree or want to hear more, then you can go ahead and uh, talk to Pastor Thomas or one of the other, uh, one of the other elders or deacons out here uh, right now, and they can kind of help get the process moving. Importantly, you can also nominate yourself. If you feel called to do this, um, please just speak to one of the other elders or deacons or Pastor Thomas and we can help this get this process moving. It's a, it's a really wonderful thing. All right. And finally, not right now, but after we sing a couple more songs, it'll be an offering time. Uh, there's many ways to give to the church. There's a QR code uh, if you want to do it electronically or via the website. The baskets will also uh, go around. So thank you for prayerfully considering uh, your gift to the church. All right. I think that is it, and we will go on to the next songs.
Thanks, Paul. Um, I guess let's all stand here um, as we sing a couple more songs. Uh, um, hope you all had a great uh, spring break, if you were on spring break. Um, if you had a, maybe your break wasn't restful. Mine was kind of stressful. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, um, I felt like I didn't get enough Jesus this week. I didn't, um, didn't get enough of him in my life, um, and I needed more of him. Um, um, I think of a funny uh, Will, Ferrell, uh, Will Ferrell sketch on Saturday Night Live, I think it was, or maybe it was one of his movies, where he said, needed more cowbell, you know, and Will Ferrell's going crazy on the cowbell. I don't know if you've probably seen some of that, but I felt like uh, I didn't need any more cowbell this week, but I needed a lot more Jesus. Um, had plenty of cows, but not enough uh, Jesus. So um, as we think about this next song, um, just think about uh, maybe grabbing onto Jesus' coattails uh, this week and um, this service today um, in the secret.
is our prayer that you know him more this week, that you are with him, he is with you. Um, this next song is, um, I think it, it, um, it goes very well with uh, what Thomas is going to preach on this morning. Um, it's not, you know, it's, they always say it's not about us, it's, you know, it's about Jesus, it's about him, and that's um, kind of what this song is all about. Um, it's not through us, it's everything good comes through Christ. And let's just sing this together, really focus on these, these beautiful words.
Thank you, Jesus. Now we'll be taking our offering so you can be seated. Jesus Christ and to confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Now, I'll ask you as the congregation to stand now, because it's not just them taking vows, it's you committing to them as well. So I ask you, do you promise to love, encourage, and support these brothers and sisters by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family and fellowship, prayer, and service? If so, answer, we do. I'll ask you all one more question. Do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of this church, to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation, and to seek those things which make for unity, purity, and peace? Brothers and sisters, will uh, you join me now as we recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed? This is the creed given to us by our Christian history and our tradition uh, typically, the pastor would ask, what is it that you believe, Christian? And then we say this together. So I ask you, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you so much for these members who are coming and joining this body. We thank you that you are growing your church, not for our own sake, but to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ into the ends of this world. God, we commit these members to you. We commission them from here as disciples and ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, indwell them with your power to go and be witnesses 
to build up the church and to seek its unity, purity, and peace. This we pray in the heavenly name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you join me in welcoming these new members? Welcome. You guys can take your seat. And I'm going to invite the kids to come down forward uh, right over here. Don't think I forgot about you. Uh, any of the kids that are here, come take a seat down here. Come on down, come on down. Neil, you're not a kid. You can't sit over here. I'm just kidding. Uh, well, good morning, guys. How are you feeling this morning? Feeling good? Good? Are you awake yet? Do you need to do some jumping jacks? There we go. Laura's all about it. She's got the jumping jacks. Everyone else is still waking up. Yep, you can sit there. Well, uh, you have a very exciting morning in children and worship, and I'm excited for what you're going to learn. Oh, thank you. I'll hold this. Uh, so let me pray for you, and then you guys can go off to children and worship uh, right towards the back uh, for a lot of fun this morning uh, with some awesome teachers. So let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much for these children, for these disciples who you are building up in the faith. Uh, we pray that you would just pour your love on them, let them experience your love, and share it with those around them. Father, we are so thankful for uh, our children, and we love them dearly. So we pray that you would go with them from here. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. You guys can go on out. Well, good morning again. I feel like I have to say that every time I come back up to the stage. It's just obligatory at this point. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, well, I am thankful today that God's mercies are new every morning, unlike my March Madness bracket, uh, which is, I'm not, I need some mercy right now. Just put me out of my misery. Uh, for those of you who have not been following our church bracket, uh, I had Kansas winning, so uh, please pray for me. Yeah, we can mourn that. Uh, along with anyone else, I mean, whew, it's just, it's, it's a tough time to be a March Madness person right now, unless uh, you had no idea what you were doing like me, but uh, somehow decided to pick the correct guesses. So uh, it's a fun time. Uh, we're enjoying the bracket still. It's not all about winning. It's about having fun. So that's good. Uh, let me pray for us as we open up God's word as we continue this series in Lent that we are in called Fully Alive. So God, we thank you for your goodness and your love to us that you have lavished so powerfully on your people Father, as we think about how our lives can be shaped by the cross of Jesus Christ, Lord, help us, humble us to see what it is that you want us to learn today, how we can become more like you each and every day. God, we thank you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. In 2017, there was a Norwegian student and academic organization that piloted this informational campaign that was criticizing, critiquing, and correcting some of the trends that they saw in the mission trip aesthetic. Now, what do I mean by that? It, it, by combining a little animated short with a satirical Instagram account, where the bio in that read, it's not about me, but really it is about me. They sought to correct some of these errors, shine a spotlight, and draw attention to the number of ways that people have used social media posts Things like that from mission trips, volunteer trips, in degrading, dehumanizing ways towards the people that they were serving. Maybe you've seen something like this, where someone is hurting, someone's dying, someone's sick and in the hospital, and someone takes a picture of them to share and say, look at the great work I'm doing, or takes a selfie with them. Maybe you've seen this on trips before. It's the mission trip aesthetic. Look how great I'm doing all, doing all this good, helpful work around the world. Oh, it's just perfect for that Instagram feed. See, when people are used as props, when photos with kids or with orphans were intentionally added to things like ads or on banners to get more likes, and this group observed that if you can photograph someone who is suffering or in need and, and you are actually doing something helpful or, or selfless in that picture, 
oh, then it was pure gold. If I could be washing their feet in the picture, if I could be handing the thirsty person a cup of water, of clean water, oh, this is the mission trip ascetic. And maybe we not, might not be so outrightly emboldened to say that it's, it's all about me or I'm thinking about me, I'm trying to do something selfless, but it kind of is about us in those moments. It kind of is about that person posting. They're thinking about themselves and how the optics of service really look. As one person wrote in an online forum, a lot less people would go on mission trips if they couldn't take Instagram photos with poor children. And the sad part is, I think he's right. See, one of the big questions that this organization would pose for people who want to post photos or videos on mission trips and service projects, things like this, is why did you do it in the first place? What, what was your intention behind traveling, behind volunteering, behind serving? And you need to be honest with yourself about that. Maybe you might not outrightly state it, but check your heart. What is your heart doing in this moment? Is it because you want to see the world? Is it because you want to gain experiences? Because I want to travel internationally? Is it because I want to experience a different culture other than my own? To tell people all about it? Was it so others would see what a humble and godly and servant-minded person I am? See, really think about it. Did you do this act of service for yourself? Or did you do it to really make a difference in the lives of others around you? See, many of us don't think about, think that we may have the audacity to go outright and say something like that. But for many of us, these, these questions, these deep-seated motivations might say otherwise. And these are the questions that we need to grapple with as, ourselves as Christians as we love and serve our community around us, as we allow our lives to be shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ and that displays in outward acts of service and love, we need to be thinking about the optics of our impact. What are our motivations? How do we do this? How do we live in a world where it's not about us, but it truly is about Jesus? How do we walk humbly with our God while we're loving mercy and doing justice? So it can be easy for us, even here at New Life, to share about all the good work that we're doing in our community, that we love our community well in Coralville Town Center, and we can get really puffed up and feel really great about ourselves. We can have a spreadsheet of all the impact that we've had, and it can make it, it go to our heads. Heck, I'm not blind to the fact that we showed a highlight video last week of all of our service. Is that exactly what I'm talking about here? I would be very easy to point the spotlight right back at myself and think about the elephant in the room. See, we could take a video like that. We could take social media posts of all the great service that we're doing in this area, and we could go to city council like we're going to this upcoming week, and we could say, look at how much we love our neighbors. Look how awesome we are. Do you see any other churches doing things like this? It can be very easy to be puffed up about the ways that we're loving our neighbor, the ways that we're doing good things. But is that really what it means to have a life shaped by the cross? To say, look at how great we're doing. Look at how great we are. Look at how great I am. Is that a life shaped by the cross? Is that cruciformed living? Is that denying ourselves and taking up our cross? Or are we simply puffing ourselves up and saying how great we are? You see the fine line and the distinction between this? We want to be intentional about sharing, about telling the people about the good news of Jesus that changes people's lives, but it's not about us. It's all about Jesus. How do we intentionally point people back to Jesus rather than just about ourselves? Do you think that it's Jesus was taking his cross up to Calvary on that Easter weekend, on that Good Friday that he was concerned about how the optics of, oh, are people going to think that this is all about me or all about what God is going to do through me? Do you think Jesus was concerned that people would be cheering for him, patting him on the back and saying, you're doing such a great job at this moment? See, a life shaped by the cross is one that may not be revered. It may not be revered by sinners or saints 
but it's one that we're called to go and die with Christ, die to ourselves, die to our optics, die to the ways that we puff ourselves up and think that we are the best. It's one of true service. So if we want to be like Jesus, we need to be careful about our motivations behind the things that we're doing. It's very easy to do a lot of good things for the wrong reasons. It's, it's easy to love your neighbor but serve yourself, which is why Jesus warns us so plainly in Matthew 6, verse 1, about this harmful tendency. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. But notice with me for a minute, the tension in Jesus' words that we've been going throughout the Sermon on the Mount, there's tension in his message. Think about how this relates to being salt and light just a few weeks ago. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus told them, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus, which is it? Am I not supposed to practice my righteousness in front of others, or am I supposed to let my light shine? Am I supposed to hide it under a bush, keep it to myself, or am I supposed to practice what I preach, practice what I do? Jesus, what do you want me to do in this scenario? How am I supposed to act and be a light to this world around me? See, if we look closely at Jesus' words, he doesn't say not to practice our righteousness but to be careful not to do it in order to, that we may be seen, in order that we may be noticed, in order that we might be praised by others. If that's our intention and our motivation behind good works, then we miss the point altogether. We are supposed to be salt. We are supposed to be light, but it's not about us. We're supposed to be not only hearers, but doers of the word, but we're supposed to practice what we preach. Let our light shine so that God will get the glory, not us. And that's the big difference that Jesus is talking about here. See, remember in this entire sermon, Jesus is challenging us to get our hearts in line with our actions, that your actions can be good, your actions can be a lot of really good and praiseworthy things, but if your heart's not in the same place, and I know I just hit that, but that's how amped up I am about this. If your heart is in a different place than your actions, then you're going to be disaligned. There's going to be dissonance. He cares just as much about your inward obedience as your outward obedience. And this week, we're going to be looking at three areas where we need to check our motives in order to make sure that our hearts are aligned with our actions. Three areas that were the, the primary pillars of Jewish piety. That if, if you were a good, righteous, or religious person of the day, of Jesus' day, you were known for these three things, giving to the poor, for deep spiritual prayer, and for sanctimonious fasting. If you did these three, you were as holy and righteous as could be. So Jesus tackles this in Matthew 6, 2 through 18. He tackles the hypocrisy that he sees even among the people that are doing this. Even among the people that have this outward obedience, he says, is your heart really there? Because really, he sees a lot of hypocrisy, people playing the part of good prayer, good fasting, good giving. So I want to encourage you this morning as we dive into God's word to open up a Bible in front of you or on your phone to Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6. And as you turn there, I, I want to remind us again that these are the words that Jesus spoke the words of our Lord Jesus that he spoke all those years ago to his followers, and they remain the same words for us today. Thank you, God, for your unchanging word. So Matthew 6 says this, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. See, in this this large section of text, Jesus hits three areas where he sees hypocritical, misaligned hearts by those who have been play-acting their righteousness in order to be seen, noticed, and praised. And in all these three areas, Jesus prefaces these actions by saying, when you do these things, not if, that, that someone who is being shaped by the good news of Jesus will be motivated towards action. It's not a matter of if you do these things, it's a matter of when. And the first thing he tells us is that charity is not about me. That when you give, it's not a matter of being thinking about how I will experience this giving. How it's about me. In fact, he it, it does way more harm and reinforces stereotypes when we come in and we play the role as savior in someone else's life. That where we give to someone and we say, look, you need me. You needed me to step in because you would have been hopeless without me. Charity is not about you. Giving is not about you. I am not the answer to someone's solutions or problems. So Jesus says, when you give to someone in need, don't announce it to everyone. It's not a show. It's not, it's not a show, and I love how Jesus says this. He says, don't announce it with trumpets. I really love that because as someone who grew up near a military base, I can hear the morning bugle call, right? The reve, I, my French is horrible, but you know, the hopefully that's going to be stuck in your head too today. I hear that when someone comes to give. Do you want to hear that morning bugle call like, look, I'm giving. Maybe it's not this obvious, but when the offering comes around, do you pull out your wallet very ceremoniously flip it open three dollars pull it out put it in the offering i mean it seems almost comical right but people did this sort of thing actually many scholars think that whether it's announcing it with trumpets being ceremonious about it this could refer in some places to the actual noise of coins dropping in the offering basket as it went around in the the place that people would come up and give temple offerings to, that if they took a big lump of coins out and dropped it into the basket, that it'd make a nice ting. That didn't make a ting, I realize that. That would make a really loud noise, and the bigger the ting was, the more holy you were. Giving doesn't become a, sh- it doesn't become a heart thing, it becomes a show thing. How loud is the ting when the offering basket comes around? See, whether it's the ting or whether it's how or your posture in giving or helping someone else, either way, the, the point Jesus is getting at is that charity is not about you or how generous others think you are. That misses the point of it altogether because God cares much more about your heart than what you put in the offering basket. See, generosity is not a show Generosity does not get you more status, whether it's in the church or in society. See, God doesn't love you more because you give more to your neighbor. He doesn't love you more because you give more to the church. And neither do I as your pastor. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I I don't know what anyone gives in the church. That's not my place to know and I don't want to know. That's between you and God, truthfully. 
So instead of being generous to increase your status, whether it's in the church or in society, the optics of it online, what's your heart doing? Your heart will say a lot more about how sold out you are for God than how much you give. He tells us to give in secret. He tells us to not make a show of it. Some people actually choose to give online because of this. That as the offering basket's going on, they said, no, I'm giving online. Some people want to be brazen about it and say, I don't want people to think that I'm not giving, so you know, I'll wear a shirt that just says, I tithed online today. That's an option. You can do that. That's fine. Some people may not share at all. It's between them and God. They don't tell anyone about any places that they give to for how much. The point is this, whenever you give, I want you to be thinking about this. Who are you giving to? Who are you thinking about when you're giving to? Are you, giving, are you thinking about the person that's being blessed with that gift? Are you thinking about the larger mission that God is accomplishing? Are you thinking about how God has entrusted you to manage his wealth wisely? Are you thinking about the person in the row next to you? Oh, what are they going to think if I don't give today? Will they be impressed if I put a little bit more in? See, I'm sure many of us can think of the person that we've met, person in our lives who maybe likes to swoop in at the last minute to write that big check to save the day, maybe likes to pay for dinner for everyone in a very ceremonious way. But does that bring glory to God with our finances and our wealth? Or does that bring glory to the individual? So we can bless people with our wealth, but we can also make wealth all about ourselves. So check your heart. What is your heart doing as we give? As we give charitably to others? This is what Jesus is pressing our attention into, especially as he turns to prayer. He says this in verse 5, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And then later on in verse 7, it says, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their words. Now, I want you to be honest with me. How many of you thought, well, Thomas, you're standing up on stage and you pray a lot, and I've heard you babble a little bit. How many people? Be honest. You all are lying to me. I know. No, I'm kidding. Well, give me a chance to defend myself a little bit, all right? Uh, Because what Jesus is saying here is that prayer is not about me. That if I get up and I stand up and praying, and I'm praying so that you will be impressed by me, if you stand up and you start praying to be impressed so that others will be impressed by you, we are missing the point of prayer. Prayer is not a tool to be seen, Prayer is not a tool for us to be admired by everyone else around us. I mean, I can remember several times in my life when I prayed around mature believers who are waxing poetic with their prayers. Some of you writers in here maybe are familiar with this kind of thing. You know people who can craft a word in such a powerful way, and you're like, mmm. You get the nice Jesus move, right? The mmm. That's good. I'm stealing that. I like that word. I like how you phrase that, and it sounds like spoken word poetry when someone's praying, and what, what's happening in that moment. Think about what you're saying in that moment, what you're experiencing. You hear these words in eloquent ways, and what are you doing with your eyes? Your eyes may be down, but you're looking up, and you're like, ooh, that's a good word. I like that. My eyes have diverted not to the prayer, but to the prayer. Ooh, see the distinction there. If my prayers are distracting others from communicating with God, then prayers become about me and not about God. See, if I'm focusing on the one who's praying rather than the one being prayed to, now I know that's not wholeheartedly their fault. Absolutely not. Part of that has to do with me and my heart in listening to it. But if we're causing others to stumble with our own prayers, we maybe need to rethink the way and, and shape that we are praying. See, if our prayers are distracting others, drawing them away from God, then we best do what Jesus said and go and find a quiet corner. Have some one-on-one prayer with God. That's more important than drawing others away from experiencing and talking and communicating with their God because prayer is not a show where I am the main character Because prayer understood rightly is, as Tish Harrison Warren says, it's a life raft 
to sustain and preserve our faith throughout a light time. It's not a, a spotlight on how great and how holy we are. She writes this, prayer is a vast territory with room for silence and shouting for creativity and repetition for original and received prayers for imagination and reason. Prayers aren't meant to turn others' heads, but they're meant to turn us towards God. Prayer should be pointing others and ourselves towards God, not turning people towards you. Sometimes that's silence. That doesn't need to be long words and eloquent speeches. Prayer isn't meant to impress those around you. It's about humbling yourself before God, saying, God, I need you. Prayer isn't about me, but it definitely does something in me. Because as we pray, it shapes and disciples us whether they're original prayers that we're making up on the spot, that we're praying what our heart is feeling, or whether they're the given prayers like the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gives to his disciples, whether they're prayers from a book or prayers from the Psalms, by turning our gaze away from ourselves and towards God and others, God is teaching us selflessness, grace, forgiveness, dependence, even daily dependence on him when we don't know the words to say. He's teaching us love, all of which is bringing glory to him and not ourselves. That's what prayer does. Prayer is about bringing glory to God, redirecting our motives and intentions onto what God wants to do in us. This is what he does in the Lord's Prayer. Around every turn, the Lord's Prayer is redirecting our attention back to God as the source of everything good, of every provision that we will have. He is holy, he is worthy, and he is totally in control. Now we could sit and we can unpack the Lord's Prayer all day. We could send a whole sermon series just on that, but I'll just touch on that for the moment. The Lord's Prayer is redirecting prayer back to where prayer is due, to God, not us. So if as we've seen throughout this teaching of Jesus, that charity isn't about us and prayer isn't about us. Can you guess what he's going to say about fasting? Fasting isn't about us either. Fasting is not about me. If your motivation for fasting is that you want people to think better of you, then you're missing the point altogether. I mean, it's Lent right now. I'm going to recognize this. And, and how many of you have given something up and fasting something throughout Lent? Oh, y'all are smart. You didn't fall for my trick. <laughs> See, I can't tell you the amount of social media posts I've seen. People saying that, oh, well, I'm fasting from social media for this time. Or, you know, I, I'm not eating this. I'm not eating meat on certain days because of Lent. I'm fasting this because of Lent. They're all over social media. They're all posted every which way. I mean, I feel like I can't even go and enjoy a fish sandwich on a Friday without people just assuming that I'm fasting something. But is fasting just about the optics? Is fasting about what other people think about us? See, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be about what others think, and it's really not something that we need to even share. See, Jesus actually goes so far as to say that we're supposed to hide our fasting. Hide the fact that you are fasting. Don't make a show of it, but disguise yourself so it doesn't look like you're fasting. Don't let others know that you are fasting. Once again, this is something that's between you and God. Because fasting is a matter of the heart. Abstinence from all sorts of things, whether it be sex, food, social media, shopping. It needs to be a conversation that you have with God, not you and your 700 followers on Facebook. For any of these spiritual practices that Jesus hits on here, we shouldn't be doing them in order to be seen, noticed, or praised by others for our outstanding holiness. Because our holiness is something that should be unseen. See, we live a different life. We live a stoic life, but we don't live it for ourselves and for our glory. We do it so we glorify as God. We should be bringing glory to God through our actions, not glory to ourselves. See, it's a fine line to walk, but Jesus calls us to this kind of holiness. He calls us to this kind of daily practice of living for him. But what does it look like for you, practically, to, to practice your righteousness in front of others? See, it looks like being mindful of your intentions, aware of your motivations. Why am I doing this? 
Am I doing this because that's what's on the church calendar and I want to be a good church member? Am I doing this because I love my neighbor dearly and I want to see this neighborhood transform for the gospel? Am I going and serving overseas because I love God's people and want to advance the gospel? Or do I love it because I want to tell people about my amazing travels? Are we doing these things for us or for God? For his glory or for ours? To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness is to seek ours second or third or later on. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's all about God. I love how Dave prefaced that song earlier. It's all about God. See, in Luke's gospel account, Jesus tells this story about two men who went into the temple to pray. One was a hypocrite, one of those people that Jesus is talking about here, who acted the part of being holy, who acted the part of, of having it all together, doing all the right things, checking all the right boxes so that others would see and look at him and praise him for how great he was. And the other person was a tax collector, the hypocrite stood in front of everyone and prayed like this, and I, I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this. He writes, Oh God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, crooks, adulterers, or heaven forbid, like this tax man. I fast twice a day and tithe on all my income. But meanwhile, the tax collector was hidden in the shadows off in the corner, hands in his face, saying, God, forgive me. Please show mercy, for I am a sinner. And it's the tax collector, says Jesus, who went home having been made right with God. See, to be a people that has been shaped and molded by the cross of Christ is to recognize that it's not about us. It's not about our outward displays of piety, having it all together, but it's about our need for Jesus. It's our need for him to say, it's not about me, but it's all about you. We need Jesus. Because without him, we would be sinners lost forever. So we could do all of the nice spiritual practices until we're blue in the face. But if our hearts are not turned to the one who calls us to live this way. If our hearts are not aligned with our actions, then we're missing the point altogether. So I want you to check your heart before you let your light shine. And then go, let your light shine before all humanity, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we thank you for this gift, this word that you've given to us, that you call us to live holy lives, but holy lives not for ourselves, not so we can get puffed up by all of the right things, checking all the right boxes, going to church every Sunday, praying, doing devotions, all of these certain things that can get us puffed up and feel really great about ourselves. But God, you want our hearts, so capture our hearts, hold our hearts. Align them with your word and then send us out by your spirit to love and serve our neighbors. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing our last song. my father's word and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the thought the rocks and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wrong this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare their master's praise 
This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is a ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died will be satisfied. The earth and heaven be God sends you out to be his hands and feet, not for your glory, but for his, to seek justice, to seek holiness and wholeness to those around us, to go and be God's people. As always, we're going to have some folks down at the front who want to pray with you, who want to lift up anything that's laying heavy on your heart, as well as celebrate the good things, the joys, the blessings that God has bestowed on his people. But as you go out from here, receive this blessing. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all until Christ returns. All God's people said, amen. Go in peace.